Hello and welcome to our first ever Zoom event. There are 113 people on this call, um, a bunch of staff members, board members, and the greater community of Partners Relief and Development, including my dog Floyd. I'm on a team comprised of 62 people. Partners Relief and Development is 28 men. I'm one of those. And 34 women. And in this past 12 months, with the support of our broader community, we've managed to reach out and help over 300,000 people. And tonight is a celebration of that. Tonight is a night to remember uh, the impacts that we've made and meet some of the people making those impacts, as well as um, some of the people impacted by 
your love, our love. I'm grateful to be here and grateful that all of you have joined us tonight. It's uh, where I am right now, it's two in the morning and my dog Floyd wants to say hi. He's the only uh, single language speaker on this call, I guess. I'm gonna try and introduce you to him right now. Come here, buddy. <laughs> he thinks it's very unfair. <laughs> and if it were earlier in the day, he would raise his eyebrow for a treat. But right now, it's not going to happen. He's just too sleepy. So Floyd, I'll let you go back to bed. We've been working for 26 years in war zones. And for 25 years, we've had one faithful, nonstop, incredible employee and friend. My daughters call her mother, Auntie, Auntie B. And uh, her village have, have been dear friends of ours for the more than 20 years that we lived in Chiang Mai, Thailand. And that person, as many of you already know, is named Bia. And so to kick off tonight's tour of the world, let's hear from Bia. everyone who joined the meeting tonight. My name is Pia. Um, I'm working with the partners for 23 years here in Chiang Mai office as the office managers. Also take care of the, our foundation here in Chiang Mai, Thailand. Since March, when the coronavirus began, we have helped a lot of people, displayed people. We um, support the supply as um, masks, hand gels, glove, soap, and medical care for the people who get infect, infected by the coronavirus. Also in Bangladesh, Yemen, Myanmar, Iraq, also here in Thailand. I want to say thank you for your kindness, your um, support that's always, um, always given to us for um, the opportunity to help others. So thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Unfortunately, Bia is taking her children to school right now. It's um, just after seven in the morning in Thailand. And so she can't be with us yet, but I'm hoping that later in this call, you'll get to meet her in person. Uh, Bia is uh, the one who holds it all together for us. She runs our office, helps run our foundation, and she's a single-handed force of nature. Um, it might be interesting to know, for those of you who have, have been with us for all these years, that when coronavirus hit in March, and when banks failed, currencies collapsed, travel was restricted, visas were upset, all of the processes of our normal work were upset. We were concerned, probably like you, that we would have to slow down and, and maybe not do the things that we're doing, maybe not follow through with some of the things that we were doing in these highly complex places. But um, it turns out that our team was able to pivot. They were able to turn on a dime and out of the 33 projects that we were running in March, 29 have continued to run until now. And in addition to those 29 projects, we've uh, increased our work across the board in every location because of coronavirus to help uh, more than 150,000 people with personal protective equipment and the things that Bia just explained for you. You're kind of like that. If you're on this call, you're very likely one of those who, instead of uh, kind of circling the wagons and stopping support and stopping reaching out, you stayed with us and you continue to help us make the impact that we have been making. It's because of you, it's because of this community that we're still on the road. 
our team uh, went from doing all of the normal things that they do to changing slightly, changing dramatically at times in order to continue the life-saving and uh, the, the family togetherness programs that we are known for in the communities that we work in. I'd like to move now to Sitwe. Sitwe in 2012 was the scene of massive sectarian violence initiated by the state. That violence resulted in 140,000 people being driven from their homes in this one city while their homes were in flames or being destroyed, while their loved ones were killed and in other ways abused. Uh, these people were forced, they, they marched from their city into a floodplain and then surrounded by barbed wire and guarded. And to this day, they're still there. And in Sitwe, our team has been working now uh, since 2012. First uh, at, the, um, at the brave and insistent um, impulse of Brad Hazlitt, our uh, senior VP of operations, uh, and then following our whole team as we got more and more involved. Now, one person has been instrumental in our work in Sitwe along uh, this whole time. And to this day, he's continuing to manage um, the support for, for people who, who lie outside the reach of larger aid services. This guy's name is Jack, and I've met him many times. He's a dear friend of mine. And he has videoed for us a walk in part of the camp that we work in. And we want to show you that walk now. Um, this is not a place that a lot of people get to go, but if you're a staff member here on this call and your video feed is live, can you raise your hand if you've been to Sitwe? I know there's some of you on the call who have been. Noam, you've been there and a and, and number of others. Um, this place has left a huge mark on us and is the start of what led to the genocide that drove people to Bangladesh, more than a million people to Bangladesh. So I'd like to introduce you to Jack, a dear friend and uh, let's see what he has to say. Hi, I am Jack. I am a Rohingya. I have been working with partners since 2012. Today, I want to take you for a visit inside of internment camp in Myanmar, where I live with about 140,000 other Rohingya. We were facing here by the military in 2012 and have been here even since unable to leave. Today, I want to show you a little bit what life look like in the camp. The people in this part of the camp are from Tandoli village their village was burned down in 2012 and they fled here along with everyone else. For eight years, they have lived here a strip of all dignity and of all right. Partner have been working with these people since they first arrived in 2012. Life here is very hard, but Partner has helped us to serve the people here are thankful for the food and shelter that partner has provided. We all consider the staff a partner our close friend. Our hope for the future is that someday we will again be free to leave this camp and return to normal life with all right we deserve. Thank you very much. Jack literally risks his life to do the work he does and to be so closely associated with us, which is why we couldn't show you his picture. But I hope that getting a little walk through part of that massive camp was an eye opener for you. If you were with me and could walk in that camp, if we were with Jack, 
I promise you that it would be an arresting experience. Um, people would come up to you as they have to me and to my coworkers and grown men would grab you by the neck uh, weeping and wanting to tell you their story. And it's a, it's a very moving place and Partners has been deeply involved there with your support um, for these past eight years. I'm so grateful for that. We'd like to move now to the Middle East where you're gonna meet my first of three friends there. Uh, in De Hook is uh, my good friend Shihab who lives in a tent with his extended family and um, whose youngest son is named after me, an honor I don't deserve. Uh, and he's probably the one and only Yazidi Steve in the world. Uh, but um, it is an honor that comes from a relationship that I am, I am so thankful for. Uh, Shihab is a genocide survivor. Uh, he and his family, um, like I said, live in a tent as refugees and have worked closely with partners since 2016. And Shihab has, uh, alongside our team, uh, risked his life as a Yazidi, uh, helping Arab people as they fled ISIS violence or ISIS occupied villages as they were liberated. I was there watching him. And the compassion, the strength, um, the courage of this man is something to behold. And uh, I'm very grateful for this friendship. So I'm gonna, let's, let's, watch, let's watch this pre-recorded video. This was recorded just last week. Welcome, Shihab. Hello, my name is Shahab and I'm from Iraq. I'm married, I have two children. We are living in Dohok uh, province as a refugee. When partners started to work here in 2016, I got to know partners by then. And I observed how partners' uh, teams, they were getting their life into risky in order to help uh, those uh, people who were under attack. Since then we've been working together in many war zones and those areas that conflicts were started and in both Iraq and Syria. And we have provided aids to thousands of people. Such things made me uh, to laugh and work with these Team. So during COVID-19, we have started with agriculture project. Such a project, we thought it's very productive and especially during this uh, tough time while uh, many people got employer and uh, it's hard to find a job. And especially for those refugees who are living in IDP's camp. Now we have five to 11 uh, laborers working on this farm every day. And this fills about 11 acres of cucumber and onions and radish. So they are working here like a daily job for them. Partners supporting uh, this uh, project. Also during the harvesting, while we are selling the products, these products, it goes to those people. I'm glad that we could achieve this uh, project during this time and we could do it through you and your support. Thank you so much. Okay, well, as technology would have it, we are able to be in multiple countries and have Shihab live on the screen with us uh, in, in uh, our office in De Hook, Northern Iraq. Uh, Shihab, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, awesome. I love this. I mean, I don't usually get to talk to you live myself and here you are in front of um, 150 people. Um, 
Amazing. Uh, Shihab, we saw the video and we saw how you creatively answered a problem that you saw when lockdown happened and quarantine happened and banks shut down uh, to answer the, the problem of joblessness around you, you started a farm and that's extremely impressive. Um, the, the, uh, okay, there's a story about you at our staff retreat, you disappeared one day and you came back with a tattoo. Um, can you show us that tattoo? Yeah. I mean, so. it's, it's, <laughs> okay. All right, that's to love is to act. It's the artwork, it's the tagline that we've been using. It's the last words of Victor Hugo. And for many of us, it's, it's the summary of the golden rule or the greatest commandment that we can't just love our neighbor um, we can't just say we love our neighbor. We have to actually do something and help them. Um, can you explain to us why is that, why was that so important to you? Why was it so significant that you tattooed it on your arm? Okay, so hello everyone. Um, um, special greetings from our team in Middle East to all you guys. And um, such, uh, such a title, it means a lot to me. And um, it, uh, it means like, uh, like the friendship and uh, honesty that I've been working with partners since I got, I've got to, to know them. And um, also, um, it's for me, it is uh, something, uh, something special. It's, uh, it's actions uh, who uh, it's always it's always louder than uh, than words. It's like how actions are uh, more available uh, than words, and through through these actions, like someone can um, uh, show and provide love to other um, by by supporting them and. And such thing will impact, and such thing will impact them and stay for them forever. Yeah. Thanks, Shihab. Shihab, um, uh, my deepest respect and thanks that you're a part of our team and uh, that you have become such an incredible friend to me and my family. We love you, man. Thanks for joining us. Um, it's an honor to be here. The next stop is uh, just next door to where, where Shihab is sitting in northeastern Syria. And in northeastern Syria is my friend Hisham. Hisham is a, uh, has been a war correspondent, foreign correspondent for the BBC, The Independent, Guardian, a couple of other uh, large publications, uh, and has uh, been responsible for documenting uh, different aspects of the conflict that's happening in the Kurdish part of northeastern Syria, or Rojava as it's called. I'm thankful that he's here with us. And before we meet Hisham in person, I'd like to show you the video he recorded this week. Hello, my name is Hisham, and I work with Partners Relief and Development. I'm a Syrian Kurd from the city of Ras Al Ain, Serekanye, and I have two children. Before working with Partners, I worked as a journalist with many international news agencies like the BBC, Los Angeles Times, The Independent, Newspaper of London, and many others, covering the complicated war that affects all of the more than 5 million Kurdish people and other communities in northeastern Syria. My primary job is helping the displaced people have food, shelter, and the main provision they need to survive. In the past two weeks, my team have given more than 600 families a month-long food supply. Of all the things that we are doing, this is the thing that matters most because they have no means, no other organization on the ground to help them, and no improvement 
in their situation insight. I feel terribly sad for them because like me, their villages are destroyed and occupied by enemy forces. So they had to live with what they could carry without any support. And now they are in a desperate situation and don't have any means to feed their children. Partners is there for them and I'm proud to be part of that line of support. War is overwhelming and violent. It destroys the lives and prospects of our children. I'm thankful to be part of a team that's helping the desperate victims by establishing schools and clinics and stays involved with people in impactful ways. I know Partners does their job with support from many of you. So I want to say thank you. Thank you so much. Your support saves lives and restores a sense of hope. This proves that people who suffer because of war are loved and not forgotten. <laughs> Hisham, welcome. And Hisham, yes, thank you. Uh, last time I was with you, I think it was November in northeastern Syria. And at the time we were in a car, we were driving and we were talking about history. You're a history teacher. <laughs> and um, at the time, our team was helping provide food for more than 24,000 people. Uh, and, and you have stepped up and continued to be a lifeline for those people. And even today, I understand you, you uh, delivered a month's supply of food for 50 families. Was that today? Did I get that right? Yeah, today, 85 families. 85 families. And when you say 85 families, how many people are in one family? It's um, about six to seven people in a okay. family. And you gave them enough food to last for a month. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. I, I want to reiterate something that your video already brought out. And that is that you yourself are displaced. Your city is occupied uh, ever since uh, the October invasion, it's occupied by uh, militia, Turkish armed forces, and sympathetic extremists who have taken your town, right? Yes, exactly. So you're, uh, I, I'm just honored to be able to work with you and uh, to be a part of your life and grateful that you're a part of ours. Um, I'm, I'm just curious, in your own words, like how, how would you describe the displaced, displaced people that were helping? You were just with them today. What is it like for them? How are they reacting when you show up? Um, like most, most of them didn't have food for more than two months. Uh, no organization on the ground to help them. So they were happy, especially the children. They were so happy the old men and women some some were just saying we are, are grateful to you 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 saved us that's uh, an incredible feeling when when you give some uh, a sense of hope to some people when you give them some kind of happiness hisham um every time i've been to your country to your place i've uh, i've wept like a baby because i've met those people and um, I'm not going to do that now. We're going to keep this um, relatively smiley. But uh, when you say that, it really touches me because um, you are you are representing the will of good news. You're representing hope, and we're so thankful that you're there um, as our ambassador, um, and and really making love something visible, not just a sentiment. So I'm really grateful, Hisham. Um, I also know that you are a professional musician 
who plays uh, a very, I mean, most of us haven't seen the instrument that's sitting next to you. And I'm wondering if you could give us uh, a few lines on your lute uh, and, and even sing a few lines of the song that, that you love the most uh, so that we can all hear uh, the music that you make. Would you mind doing that? Of course. Pleasure. Thanks, Hisham. I'll just uh, maybe with Mike, maybe the sound would be better. So can you hear that? Can you make? Um, it's a song from the Kurdish culture. It's called uh, Sweet Freedom. So I will just make it in one minute. Um, thank you so much. Um, when you play that song, it makes me think of the team that I'm a part of. And uh, there are 39 of our team members on this call right now. And I'd like to invite all of our team members to unmute and say hello and give a wave to the camera. Hi, guys. Hi everybody. Hello. Hi. Everyone. Hello. Hi, Dave. Great to see you. <laughs> The heartbeat of what we do, um, the fundamental thing we have to offer comes from our community and everyone on this call is a part of that. Um, and uh, I feel incredibly, incredibly grateful to be a part of a team that is so motivated to make um, make good news visible, to make it happen, um, to make the gospel something visible, something real. I'm grateful. Uh, now we're going to go to another country in the Middle East, into Yemen. Uh, if you Google Yemen, you will find a heartbreak. You'll find 80% of the people in that country dependent on aid. You'll find not hundreds of thousands, but millions of children starving. Uh, and you'll find a whole lot of bad news due to political complexity, proxy warfare, uh, and just sustained uh, violence. The wonderful people of Yemen suffer. And there's a guy named Fatik that Brad met while he was in exile in Jordan. And Brad is our VP of operations, senior VP of operations. Brad met this guy and found a friend, found a partner, found somebody who not only loves soccer, but loves people. And Fatik has been busy going about the, the job of loving people now for these years since we've known him. And most recently uh, has been involved in feeding thousands of uh, uh, people thousands of families, 
as well as providing shelter for those who were uh, affected by the recent floods, compounding war, compounding famine, ca compounding all of the, the struggles that these people go through uh, were terrible floods that took away the shelter and homes for so many families. Fatik applied for permission to reconstruct 200 shelters and, and uh, just uh, has, has now finished construction on 100 and has 100 to go. I'd like to show you a, a, just a short video from Fatik now that he sent us from Yemen. Meet Fatik. Hello friends, my name is Fatik and I live in Sana'a of Yemen. I have five children and I worked for years as a journalist. Now, with partner support, I'm helping providing food for starving people and shelter for those who don't have it. I'm so thankful for partners and for you, the people who support this work. We are making a big impact here in Yemen. Let's keep doing that. Thank you so much. Fatik is also a journalist before he found his second calling, which was to start a, a community organization called Mona Relief. And they are our partners in Yemen. And while we're not at the level of millions, we are at the level of thousands. And for those thousands, uh, your generosity, your compassion, your love is making a massive impact today in a country far, far away. So thank you so much. Um, we have another guest here. I, I forgot to mention that Greg Taves, Greg, would you wave please? Here, I'll just uh, put you on spotlight so everyone can see your beard, which is just lovely, dude. Um, despite the beard, he has the cutest dog in the world and a wonderful family. Greg lives in the question box, which is at the bottom of your screen. If you'd like to ask questions, Greg's your guy. So uh, go ahead and tap on Greg's shoulder with any questions you might have. Um, we're going to a place now that is um, very dear to my heart, a place where I have uh, spent most of my adult life Mela refugee camp. Um, my kids grew up uh, visiting this camp and visiting specifically the home of Arthur and Clasper. And many of you on this call I know, and I know that you have actually been to Arthur and Clasper's home, <clears throat> where for more than 20 years they have been taking in unaccompanied minors because of the war inside Myanmar and Karen State, and uh, children who want to go to school, but because of the war cannot, they don't have access to education. So they, they go and live with Arthur and Clasper. And, uh, and, and for 20 years now, I don't know, I tried to get a count last time I was with them, but, and I wanna say thousands of kids have been affected, but at least hundreds and hundreds of children have grown up and gone on to be medics and nurses and teachers and pastors and every conceivable place in Karen society in Myanmar and all around the world in Canada and the US. I meet them in Australia, kids who grew up with Arthur and Clasper. And um, I, I just can't say enough about this couple Arthur is the bravest, most understated man I've ever met. Uh, when we first started working with him, he called me on the phone. This is like late 90s. And um, he said, Steve, uh, I've got 140 villagers with me. We don't have any clothes or food or anything for them. We're standing beside the road. Can you help me? And the story is that these people were surrounded by Myanmar army soldiers who wanted to kill them. They, uh, they, they were surrounded in the, in the, at the front of a cave. The villagers knew there was a back way out of the cave, but the back way out where the stream ran through the cave was landmined. 
And if Arthur told you the story, what he would say is he prayed and God led him through that minefield to the back of that cave where he found those people and <laughs> said, hey, come out guys, I'm here and led them to safety in Thailand. And just hours after that happened, he called me in Chiang Mai. <laughs> this guy is amazing. And he has stories like that forever and ever. But as you'll see in the video, he's a cool operator. Let's meet Arthur and Clasper and the children living with them. Hello, I am Pastor Arthur. I'm Claspa. We have been supporting and accompanying children to finish their education in Mela Refugee Camp for 20 years with support from partners. Right now, we have 93 children living with us. We want to thank partners and all those who support this work. And the children who live in with us would like to sing a song for you now. like to know that for all these years, like 18, 20 years, every single child that has lived with Arthur and Clasper has learned either to play the violin, to sing, or a brass instrument, or all three. And if you stay to the end, you're going to hear the violin section, the string section. Uh, and it's absolutely astounding. And if we had the time <laughs> and the bandwidth, we would show you the brass section with tuba and everything. So uh, just a fantastic example of love and compassion and sacrifice. Arthur and Clasper could have left a long time ago. They could have enjoyed a, a life of privilege because of who they are. And instead they stay in that refugee camp, raising those children who have gone on to be world changers. I'm so grateful to get to work with them. And another guy I'm grateful for, Greg, if you would unmute that mic, I just want to introduce everyone to our board chair. This is Greg Prickett. Greg, can you just say hello and give us a greeting? 
Hello and greetings to everyone. I'm so thankful that you're here and I especially want to greet all the hardworking partners team. I got to tell you, it just brings a smile to my face to see your smiling faces. And so <laughs> please know that you are not forgotten. We love you and we're thinking of you often. Greg, I'm so grateful for your support. And I know Ernie's on this call, Ernie Taves, Partners Canada, who deserves the biggest shout out, who has been an instrumental part of the development of partners for longer than Greg. I mean, like since, <laughs> since before time, thank you. Um, it's a privilege now to introduce you to someone else I'm very proud of who grew up in Arthur and Clasper's home. This young lady's name is Tamilar, and she's one of 22 students who is attending the GED program right now. And uh, I'm hoping that we'll get to, to talk to her after this video, but let's go ahead and show the video that she recorded last week, and we'll see how it goes. Tamala. Hello, my name is Noda Mulapa, and originally I'm from Korean state in Myanmar. In 2010, I moved to Thai Myanmar border in Mela refugee camp, and I stay with Clasper and Arthur, and I grew up there, and I completed high school and college there. And all along here, I was supported by partner organization. Uh, after that, uh, I, uh, I served my community as a teacher for three years. Fortunately, I got a great opportunity to attend the KGED school that's supported by partner organization. Now I'm trying to get my GED certificate and after that I wish to go to university to become a master teacher. Uh, after I completed if I finish the university, I wish to be a benefit person for to those who need my help. Hello, Natamula. How are you? Hi. Oh, wonderful. Tamula is in Masat, Thailand and uh, is joining us live tonight, today, as it were. And I'm so happy that you're with us, Tamala. Um, I'm, I'm, uh, there's, there's one point about your story that I'm not sure everyone understands. You went through high school and then you went through college to be a teacher, right? Why do you need to go to college again? Why, why, why do you, go to university now after you've already finished college? I know that education is very important. Uh, as, I, as I think education and my, I have not qualified in education yet. So I want to get more education and for help, not only for myself, to help people. Um, that that is a beautiful thing that you want to go back and help your people. And um, what I've understood is that if you take the GED, you will get an accredited degree, a degree that says internationally, you can be a teacher, not just in the camp. And um, I'm very grateful that I can be a part, that we can all be a part of helping you get that education. Um, one qu a question I had about your life, though. Why did you leave your village in Myanmar and move to Mela refugee camp alone? Why, why did you leave your family? The main thing that I, I have to leave my village uh, was education. Education is very important for me. And as well as my family cannot afford for me because I have so many brothers and sisters. Uh, it is hard for my family to support to go to school. So that's why I have to, I moved to Thai Myanmar border for my future education. 
Kamala, we're all proud of you. And I know you will go far. Your teacher, Dylan, told me that you're an excellent student. <laughs> and um, we're believing that you will finish that GED test exam and that you will go on uh, to serve your people just like you want to. I'm glad that we on this call could all be a part of your story. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Tamla Pa. <clears throat> Thank you. Okay, now, just north of Massot, actually pretty far north of Massot, if you're driving a car, it would take you about six hours on the border road to get to Sean State. And from Sean State is an all-star on our staff named Noom. And um, a sweet little piece of trivia about Noom that maybe helps you understand why he's so well suited for partners is that when he was younger, he studied to be a monk, a Buddhist monk, to the point where he was practicing austerity and living out in the jungle alone. That's kind of extreme. That's like monk number 10 out of 10, <laughs> if, you, if you live out in the jungle. And as he was living out in the jungle and meditating, trying to keep all of the rules, he uh, kind of failed because he's only supposed to eat once a day as a monk or twice at the most, but Noom at night would sneak special food from the begging bowl without the abbot's knowledge. Noom is an unorthodox rule breaker who consistently risks his life to support aid interventions in Sean State, to support uh, development projects in Sean State, and all kinds of different special projects aimed at helping this ethno-linguistic group, this wonderful group of people numbering 10 million people. Um, what we'd like to focus on now is his, his work with sustainable schools. So we're gonna, sh we're gonna see a video and I'm hoping we're gonna get to meet Noom right after this video. Hello, my name is Noom. I'm Sean and manage project in Shan State where 7 million people have been suffering from war because of the Myanmar army. We do things to help children drive despite the conflict. We run agricultural trainings to increase farm yields so families can provide themselves and provide aid during frequent conflicts that happen each year. We have trained hundreds of village health workers who provide health care in remote villages. We do many other projects to empower families in the care of their children. The project I would like to highlight now is one we call Sustainable School Projects. We have provided education project for many years in Shan State, but this one is different. Instead of monthly sport, we provide a small business loan to local school boards who manage the investment and use profits to support the school. Over 90 projects have been implemented and some are sufficient. After several years of running this project, there are some projects have paid back their principal loans. I am very proud to be a part of these innovative projects that has enabled to support thousands of children for an education, even though their communities are very unstable because of war. Partners Live and Development is making 
a massive impact in the lives of the most vulnerable people in my country and I get a part of it and you are doing the same. Thank you so much for supporting our work through partners. นุ่มพูดภาษาไทยได้มั้ยได้ครับนุ่มพูดภาษากี่ภาษาครับสี่ภาษาครับสี่ภาษาภาษาอะไรเป็นภาษาสุดท้ายครับอ่าภาษาภ
the one you've all been waiting for. How does one cook spicy soup with the raw ingredient of stinky poop? This is our question. And this next video narrated by uh, our young, energetic and amazing team member, whose name is Watt, with the assistance of the farmer extravaganza who has trained hundreds of farmers in integrated farming, aquaculture, uh, rice intensification, all kinds of in interventions that increase yield for poor farmers in war zones without requiring money or chemicals or esoteric knowledge. These two guys are gonna tell us like it is. Let's hear it. Hello everyone, my name is Wat and I have worked with Partner Relief and Development almost four years and today we are at the farm running by Partners Chiang Mai, Thailand. This is Pising, the farm manager and trainer. We teach the method to increase rice yield and alter simple step to increase animal and agriculture products with our additional money. We have trained a hundred of farmers here who are returning to their village in Myanmar and apply the skill and knowledge for their own benefit. And today I want to show you how to turn the cow poo to the gas and use that gas to make a delicious soup. So after we take the cow poo from the enclosure, we have to pour all the poop that we got to this box. So this box we go directly to the big biogas. After the poo and the water go directly to the biogas. In this big bowl, half of them are water. So the poop go down to the water and the gas cannot stay in the water. So they float up. So here, half of our bowl is the gas. We can use this gas to connect directly to our kitchen and start a fire and cooking for us. Partners care for us and help giving us opportunity to have a chance to live better. Thank you to partners and donors everywhere who help us and support us our work. Thank you. Now you too can cook hot spicy soup from nothing but poop. I'd like to bring on Bia, who has, I don't know if I said this, but Partners has been around for 26 years. Bia has been running our office for 25 of those years. Bia, can you unmute your microphone, please? I know you just dropped your kids off at school. Just wanted to ask you a quick question. You've been with us longer than anybody. What's it about? Why are you with us? What are we doing? 
สวัสดีค่ะสวัสดีค่ะคุสติสวัสดีค่ะทุกคนค่ะสวัสดีครับทำไมถึงเบียอยู่กับพาร์ทเนอร์ยี่สิบห้าปีครับทำไมถึงเบียตั้งใจอยู่ต่อครับบิ๊กเดี๋ยวภาษาไทยหรือภาษาอังกฤษดีคะ You need to speak English now. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm here because of um, the work at Partner is to love is to act. They, you know, like every time, everywhere that need help, you know, Partner will just go straight right away to to the place that need help. They not even wait to for anything. You know, they're just gonna go there and help. So um, I'm proud. I'm proud to be a part of the team. I'm proud to be um, a part of this family. I'm proud to be, um, you know, in the small. It's a small piece of this big family. I'm just proud, and I'm, I'm here for uh -huh. almost 26 years. <laughs> <laughs> Makes me feel proud to be a part of your life too, and. Say hi to your mom and your uncle and your whole village for me. I miss them all, and also I miss you. Thank you, Bia. Ka, k o u ka, k o u ka. I told you that we would have one more musical interlude, one more contribution from Mela Refugee Camp. This is the string section. James is going to cue that for us right now. <laughs> Partners really started in 1994 because my wife and I felt that it was hollow and shallow to tell the only known survivor, a young four-year-old little girl, to tell her that God cared about her and pray for her and leave that refugee camp. And um, all of the people on this call, all of our staff, have continued to walk in that legacy. That it's not enough to just talk; we have to act. And in acting, what we have found is the magnification of love, the unstoppable force of goodness, the gospel, of love in the world that cannot be stopped by war or by anything. Uh, community of partners, we are an unstoppable force, and I'm grateful to be a part of this community tonight. You've heard from people all around the world tonight, the world that we work in, and I expect that that world will continue to grow as we continue to express the love that we have found in concrete steps. Just want to grab one more person here. <laughs> okay, <laughs> we're just gonna say good night. This is Floyd again. Say bye, buddy. And actually, if he's more awake, he can raise one eyebrow, and it's really amazing. But um, it's 
actually three in the morning and we're six minutes over time. We've done 86 minutes around the world. And what we're all about is loving, not just with our tongue, with our words, but loving in actions and in deed. Thank you so very much for joining us tonight. It's a privilege to be a part of you. God bless you all. Oh, good night, guys. yeah, everybody unmute and say good night. Yeah, good night. 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 Good